So what I want to talk about today is not necessarily language learning, but decoding what deep neural models learn about language. So as I'm sure uh, all the audience here knows that deep neural network models are everywhere. Uh, in any domain of artificial intelligence, machine learning, data science, when there is enough data, there are enough examples of a particular task, you see traces of neural network based models that learn patterns from these large data sets. And the domain of language and speech processing is no exception. Here I uh, have put a sketch of the transformer network, which is now the front runner in neural network architectures. And um, as you can see, I'm not gonna explain the architecture, but what I hope that you can see from a very shallow glance is that this is a very complex architecture. On the right hand side, you see a language model called BERT, um, which is basically the foundation of many models, nat natural language processing models for various applications. Um, and these BERT-based models have several different layers. So you see that the small base BERT has 12 layers and the BERT large model has 24 layers of some part of the transformer architecture. So that's the, where the power comes from, from this complexity and from the depth of uh, these models. But with this power comes a cost. All right, so as I was saying, Deep neural network models are very powerful, but they're very hard to understand because of uh, their complex architecture and because of the ma very many parameters that they have. Um, we can't easily understand the inner dynamics of these models. And this poses a challenge for both people who want to use these in applications, uh, uh, as well as the researchers who want to understand how these models work. So some of the main questions that we are faced with are, for example, what aspects of input does a model pay attention to? What knowledge does a model learn to perform a particular task? How can we use this information to improve both the performance and the generalizability of such a model for a new domain or for the new task or a new data set? So what I'm gonna to do today is not to provide any answers, but to uh, give you some glimpse of some general approaches that people have proposed for getting some insight into how these models work. The first approach that I wanna talk about is input manipulation. So this is a, an approach that's actually inspired by behavioral psychology. The idea is that you have a black box, you wanna understand how it uh, operates. So you basically manipulate the input that you give to this box and then observe its behavior. So as an example, let's say that we wanna measure how much the output of a natural language processing model changes if you remove one word from an input sentence. Can you move to the next slide? Yeah, so as an example of a task, um, let's assume that we train a model that learns to map images to captions. So if we give enough examples to the model, it can actually map this picture of a baby laughing uh, and looking at the computer to the caption, a baby sits on a bed laughing with a laptop computer open. Next slide. Now, if you, if you manage to quantify the contribution of each word, you will see that um, on the x-axis we have each word and on the y-axis we have the contribution of that word. And if you look at the blue line, which is uh, the version that I just told you about, you see that the word baby is the most important word in this caption. Um, so that's giving us some very general idea of what kinds of words these models pay attention to. If you are curious to see what happens if we remove the word baby from this example, uh, next slide will show you. Next slide, please. Yeah, so if we remove the word baby, this is the picture that the model will return. So there, is, there seems to be a, a, a true understanding of what happens and the corresponding between words and uh, elements in the caption. Now, if you accumulate this kind of information, uh, the next slide, please. You will see that a model like this, for example, pays attention mostly to uh, 
adjectives or nouns that are labeled as JJ and N and ignore certain types of words such as determiners, prepositions, and so on. So these kinds of input manipulations give you some insight about what types or what parts of the input the model actually pays more attention to and uses in the task that it performs. But it does let, uh, tell us little about the actual representations that the model learns. So uh, this takes us to the next approach. Can you show me the next slide? Yes. So here, the idea is that we want to actually analyze these internal representations that these deep models learn. The questions that we might have to want to ask is, what aspects of language does the, mo the model encode? For example, does the model encode linguistic forms such as words, morphemes, phonemes, syntactic structure, and on which layers? The, does this information get encoded? Does it encode anything about the meaning and again on which layers? So one approach that, that one technique that has been widely used, next slide please, is what is typically called auxiliary tasks or probing classifiers. The idea here is that you have this model that you have trained to perform task X, but now you want to know whether this model learns anything or encodes anything about knowledge Y. So what you do is you give the, mod, the original model and input, then you record and extract the activations on any layer of this model, which is usually a vector of numbers, and then you pass this as input to a classifier or a regressor that predicts knowledge Y. And the argumentation here is that if you manage to train a classifier or a regressor that predicts the, your hypothesized knowledge with uh, acceptable um, accuracy, then the original model must have learned something about that type of knowledge. So here is a, uh, yeah, next slide. The, here's a number of uh, sample auxiliary tasks that you could potentially use for the example model that I showed you before, mapping images to uh, sentences. You can uh, train classifiers or regressors to predict, for example, the length of the utterance, the, the presence of specific words, representation of semantic or form similarity, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, next slide. This is a sample uh, snapshot of the results of an, a such analysis on a model that we've been working on, where you see that the best performing uh, probes, probing classifiers or probing regressors for tasks that uh, include uh, some sort of information about linguistic form are often um, the ones that use input um, activation layers from lower layers in the model. And if you use activations or representations from top layers, then models that involve some sort of a meaning usually perform better. So these are very widespread techniques, these probing classifiers or auxiliary tasks. So the last approach that I wanted to tell you about is um, representational similarity analysis. So what happens in the case of probing classifiers or auxiliary tasks is that we are trying to map representations learned by a model to a different representational space, for example, to the space of morphology or, or syntax. But when these representational spaces became, become more complex or uh, structured, then these probing classifiers don't work very well. So here, uh, in a different type of technique that is actually borrowed from computational neuroscience comes to our rescue. This is called representational similarity analysis. And the idea is that you have the same set of stimuli or data points but these are arranged differently in two different representational spaces. One is the representational space that our model learns, and the other one is the target or hypothesized representational space that we are interested in. And what we want to do is to actually measure the correlation between the similarities, pairwise similarities between points across these two uh, spaces. Next uh, slide, please. So what we need here is basically a similarity metric within two spaces A and B, and what we don't need is a mapping between these two spaces. So in that sense, these models are very versatile. And just as an example of their application, next slide. Next slide. Uh, we applied this method to BERT uh, that I mentioned on the first slide to see whether it encodes anything about syntactic structure. And here you see that the red lines 
the BERT model actually encodes most synthetic structure on its top layers, namely layers 22 to 24. So to wrap up what I just said, next slide. Um, this domain of developing interpretability techniques for deep neural models of language is a very young domain, but it's a very fastly uh, moving and developing. And we see new techniques being introduced um, pretty much every day. Um, and you can generally think of these as two different general approaches. One, when we have a hypothesis in advance, we are looking in the for the encoding of a hypothesized type of information in our models. So probing classifiers or representational similarity analysis are examples of this approach or data-driven approaches when we uh, look at how these representations are formed. For example, by manipulating input or uh, following the propagation in these networks. Um, I wanted to uh, finish my presentation by telling you about this recent project that was just funded by NWA, um, which is exactly uh, focused on this uh, pursuit of interpretability techniques for deep learning models, uh, for deep models of text and sound. And uh, last slide, please. The, there are quite a few uh, PIs involved in this project. But as you can see, we also have three people from Tilburg, Tom Lenz, Trevor Kupawa, and myself, all from uh, School of Humanities and Digital Sciences. So if you have any questions, I would be very happy to answer. Thank you very much.